Hello, everyone. My name is Spencer Walsh, and in the final episode of Hidden History, Season 4, we have the conclusion of a dirty, deadly war between revolutionaries and terrorists, and a slow realization that at the end of the day, things essentially ended up the exact same as they were before all of the fighting. That is right, ladies and gentlemen. On today's show, we are concluding our look into Nicaragua, our four-part series taking you into the Sandinista era. It all ends today as we are jumping from the mid-80s to the present. We have a lot of very important stuff to cover the continuation of the Sandinistas, the end of the Contra War, and the 90s to today. All very interesting and important stuff to get into. It's my pleasure to get into it with you all for really what is. It's almost it's almost kind of sad. <laughs> yeah, summer is over. So is our fourth season of Hidden History. What a season it's been. It's been an absolute pleasure absolute pleasure to uh, go through this experience and to really my, my opinion it's you know definitely the ep- uh, the season i've put the most work into um the, i've done the most research for and i hope i really really hope it sounded the best out of any you know hidden history season for you um you know definitely on average the best quality of episodes i've put out so very very proud of it and i hope you guys uh listening are just as happy with it all as I am. But before we get into our programming for today, just a quick little message uh, so you can get in touch even if, you know, you are or you aren't happy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening and supporting Newsflash. We now have a brand new way for you to be heard if you want whether a text message or a audio message, please no video messages. I really just do not think that's necessary. We have a new feedback box open for you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is officially open. SWRN702 at gmail.com. Send a text message. Send a voice message um, of no more than 30 seconds via the voice memos function. Either of those two options, and we will 100%, 100%, not going to find this guarantee anywhere else, we're going to play it on the show, listen to what you have to say, and it literally could be about anything. Well, if it's inappropriate, we won't play it, but it could be about anything. Thank you so much. This is my thank you to all the listeners who have stuck out with us and want to have their own voice in the show. SWRN702 at gmail.com is the address to encourage hope to see some responses from that address um yeah and just letting you know what you think about hidden history newsflash whatever and you know, really all of it but i do want to start today by taking you back to last week's show where we talked about the rise of the cia funded contra militia in nicaragua their crimes and how they supported themselves we with the help of gary webb's heroic reporting that i would personally argue that he died for took a look at how the contra militia in order to raise funds for weapons to fight the sandinistas introduced the highly addictive crack cocaine strain into the american inner cities with at best complicity from the cia and at worst active facilitation and cover-up of the Contra's drug smuggling activities by the CIA. Now that we've looked at a little bit into their key funding sources, let's get back to the history of events. In other words, what the Contras actually did to the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. As the CIA got former general from the brutal Somoza dictatorship, again, this is the, the regime that was about to bomb its own civilians, uh, when the Sandinistas were at their doorstep in the mid to late 70s, um, they got this general from that force, Enrique Bermudez, as we talked about last week, on board to meld the Contras into one single fighting force. This is before they were kind of a coalition, a ragtag bunch of uh, kind of anti Sandinista forces. Bermudez, with the help of the CIA, is the man to put them all together. Um, 
Again, this is the same CI connected Contra Bermudez who met with the two cane, cocaine smugglers from last week, Landon and Menzies, and urged them to pick up their fundraising efforts. You know, we'll leave it up to interpretation is what he meant by fundraising efforts. Uh, again, this is a guy who who knew them and, you know, he could get off on this all day long. You know, they, they knew. They knew. They knew everything that was going on. Anyway, Nicaragua's short period of peace caused by this, uh, you know, the winning of the Sandinistas and the kicking out of the Somoza regime was quickly disturbed uh, by the rise of the Contras. The United States has intervened in Nicaragua again. This time, the sixth time since the late 1880s, proving beyond any shadow of a doubt that they would continue to be a specter over the shoulder of Nicaraguans who simply wanted to run their own country free from foreign influence and the endless need to serve the powerful for fear of annihilation. They had been under U.S. control. The U.S. had exploited their economic resources for too long for them to be able to waltz off right into the distance and be able to start their own communist country like nothing ever happened. You know, they they had been too long, for too long, too comfortable with the source of resources, the rich, natural resource, rich country. Uh, you know, that was a big part of it. Also, the fact that they, again, were fighting and funding, uh, you know, rebels in other other countries and the fact that, you know, it was high the Cold War, all of that stuff. Um, yeah, again, not only was it deeply, uh, un- deeply unacceptable, though, obviously, to the U.S. on a material kind of foreign policy level, there was also a sense of personal indignance at the Sandinistas from top U.S. CIA and kind of uh, governmental officials. How dare those backwater brown people... They think they can break us. They think they can break from us. They think they can kick us out of their own country. That was the mindset from those at the top of Langley. Much like, uh, like much of the Western Hemisphere, really, CIA leadership, uh, hell, U.S. leadership from Ronald Reagan on down, they thought they owned the place. Not only had the Sandinistas proved them wrong, they'd humiliated the Americans. And the CIA guys don't like to be put in their place. So, Early on in the Contra War, the Sandinistas were getting hit hard. The Contras rolled in with U.S. funds and U.S. weapons and were able to make steady progress in the north and south of the country. Like Sankara and Lumumba before them, the Sandinistas, led by Daniel Ortega, did not want to go to the Soviet Union for help, preferring a non-aligned global south that had self-sufficient yet interconnected economies working together against the all-encompassing behemoths of the First and Second World. But the pressure was just too overwhelming and the Contras were left with no, or the Contras really left the Sandinistas with no choice but to turn to the Soviet Union for help in fighting off the U.S. backed counter revolutionaries. This obviously gave the United States a critical propaganda win, as it did with the two aforementioned Africa situations. They can now paint Ortega and the FSLN as Soviet puppets and the country of Nicaragua as a potential beachhead for a communist invasion to their domestic population who would eagerly eat up that anti-communist propaganda at the height of the Cold War. It was a risk the Sandinistas had to take, or the government, which, as we discussed in episode 12, had already made some progress for the Nicaraguan people, would be snuffed out in the cradle. One can only imagine, though, if the Contras had never existed or never seen U.S. support, whether the Nicaraguan Soviet alliance would have ever existed, or if the government would feel the need to be as aggressive and, at times, illiberal as it turned out to be in response to Contra aggression. But... This, obviously, is an unprovable counterfactual we'll never know the answer to. Here are two former Sandinista ministers really pretty well describing the kind of impossible situation they were put in at the time. Part in the Cold War, we believed in non-alignment and non-involvement in the East-West conflict. But in the end, when the revolution was being besieged and strangled, and above all suffering militarily from the aggression, we went to Soviet bloc countries for weapons. Arms and uh, helicopters and planes. Under pressure of the United States, no one would give us anything. So we need something to defend ourselves. And it's, it isn't that we're accepting, we, we asked to buy those weapons because we needed. And if the United States prevented everyone else in the West to sell us weapons, what are we going to do? Allow our country to be overrun? Yeah, so that was kind of the, that was kind of the, the the situation they were they were put through. This was a guy who was a minister 
in the Sandinista government. He was talking to Al Jazeera there and essentially kind of laying out the nature of the situation. It was like, we didn't, we didn't want to do this. We wanted to be not aligned. We wanted to kind of do our own thing. But the, it was kind of an, an impossible choice the United States left things, things up to. I mean, according to journalists at the time, the war in Nicaragua was very much paralleled by another U.S. imperial imbroglio, the Vietnam War. A hot, dense jungle environment where guerrilla fighters spent most of their time hunting down their enemies in a long, boring slog only to be interrupted by a rapid, sporadic burst of gunfire where whole companies could die very quickly. The Sandinistas, in response to aggression by the Contras, began to randomly take land of suspected Contra collaborators. This marked the beginning of that illiberal turn and caused some of their strongest bases of support, the peasant class, to begin to grow skeptical of Sandinista leadership. In the fog of war as well, freedom in the press was limited and a state of emergency was established. Already under a microscope from the Contras and drawing the full ire of the U.S. Empire really trying to take them out, the pressure from the Sandinistas began to grow more and more until, as promised, they held or the pressure against the Sandinistas. Excuse me, began to grow more and more. You know, to be more democratic, to be the kind of a human rights followers that the Contras clearly were not being, uh, and the pressures began to grow so strong until, as promised. They held their elections. The FSLN did, the Sandinistas did in 1984, which as we talked about in part two of our series, Danny Ortega won. This quelled fears of an authoritarian turn for a time and proved the Sandinista revolution was still popular with the people. And really, even as the, you know, Contra War raged, the U.S. kind of had to claim the FSLN really was fair and square because not even they could say oh this election was rigged it was declared fair and above board by international observers this was something that was a pretty big you know kind of pr win as well as a political win for the sandinista because they kind of showed hey we're not the country that the united states is portraying us as uh and they were able to do that a few more times um which was really really quite helpful because again it showed that they were getting a raw deal in terms of their representation and in terms of the way that they are being treated by the international community and the criticism they're facing, especially from the United States. Fresh after a win at the ballot box, though, the Sandinistas became a little bit arrogant. According to a Nicaraguan newspaper editor that was close to the Sandinistas that spoke to Al Jazeera decades later, he said they thought they could do no wrong and the people would unquestionably obey their decisions, which proved to be a big mistake. Indicative of both this dynamic of getting too comfortable, maybe, in your, your position of power, and perhaps them feeling a little bit of heat from the Contra insurgency, the Sandinistas instituted a conscription program, oftentimes at gunpoint. This major step took a key sense of freedom that Nicaraguans felt like they had won with their revolution away in the blink of an eye, or should I say, the stroke of a pen. This is what freedom looks like, many Nicaraguans asked. We fought a revolution, and now you're making our sons go to battle yet again? It was a devastating psychological effect for many Nicaraguans who really began to dislike the ruling Sandinistas more and more as the fighting wore on. They were like, hey, you know, if we... If we are supposed to be free people, if we're supposed to have social justice, if we are supposed to have control over our own lives, I do not want my son, my you know sub eighteen year old son, to be forced into the battlefield. That was what you know a lot of people were saying at the time, and more and more people got to be more and more aggravated and uh, unnerved and kind of freaked out by the the turn of the Sandinistas and their kind of by any means message any means necessary approach to taking out the Contra rule. Another heavily impacted part of a Nicaraguan society was the immensely powerful Catholic Church. The conservative Archbishop of Managua openly endorsed the Contras from the pulpit, another major blow to the Sandinista support base, especially as poor rural Nicaraguans were far more likely to be members of the Catholic Church. Well, the, you know, they were definitely taking some hits. Uh, you know, the Sandinistas were, um, you know, they were they were losing some ground. They were getting hit pretty hard. They had to turn to Soviet weapons and all that stuff. Uh, they had to, you know, institute a conscription program, which is never a good thing. 
uh, you know, if you start up not having to do it in a war and then you end up having to do it, it's not a good thing to put your people through by any stretch of the imagination. You know, they got the Catholic Church turning against them. But still, Ronald Reagan felt he wasn't doing enough. He imposed an economic embargo on the country, a la Cuba, which even though the country was rich in natural resources, actually turned out to be incredibly devastating. Nicaraguans had always boasted of their remarkable natural resources and top agricultural conditions. It was something that, you know, being a you know a naturally patriotic, proud people, you know, proud of their country, proud of their, their heritage and their homeland. They were really, you know, a agrarian society and they knew how to do, you know, they know to, they know to do crops. They knew to do crops if that was one thing. Uh, they were incredibly good at you know the, the cotton crop the, as a as a cash crop was a big part of their economy, but they also grew the, you know, the most amazing fruits, you know vegetables, any sort of crop that you could really imagine. Anything could grow there, you know, from the the uh, the sweetest corn to the ripest peach, all that stuff. It was a really kind of a garden of Eden for growing things. And then you got a you know a freaking volcano, or you know right down the road. It really is a pretty incredible place, you know. In some of my research, it really made me kind of a place I want to would want to go see. Even though you know it's definitely not a good position right now, um, the embargo shut out all Nicaraguan access, though, to key materials used to bring their valuable crops to market. Everything from fuel to fertilizer was cut off from the Nicaraguan economy, and the farmers, especially those of the cotton, which is the most profitable economic engine for the Nicaraguans, especially at a time when war was ripe. You know, things were getting blown up. You know, sixty-six point five percent of the Sandinista budget was going to the war, so they needed all the kind of economic returns via you know tax revenue and just general economic activity that the selling of these goods and bringing the goods to market represented. So these you know not only could they not produce and you know take care of their crops in the same way because of the lack of access to goods because the embargo you know they couldn't ship stuff out they couldn't um, send their cotton they couldn't send their fruits, they couldn't send their vegetables out into the world because of the fact the United States has closed down all of the markets. They were trying to, whether it be, you know, militarily, they were trying to either, you know, buy buy blood or by starving them out. They were trying to, the United States was trying to destroy this Nicaraguan government, which I really can't emphasize enough. Like this was an all out war against a state that was, you know, way, way, way less powerful than the United States was. Um, and it was still, at, at least at this time, being the kind of little engine that could continuing to fight on. I mean, the Sandinistas, though, they were they were definitely hurt by this. They structured a lot of their economy around agricultural production and land redistribution, but the farmers couldn't produce transport or even bring their goods to foreign markets because the U.S. cut them off from all of it. The embargo slash economic blockade and the destruction from the war began to cause acute scarcity. People were reduced to eating iguana, which they believed was some marvel cure for all ailments, as the austerity and lack of access to goods further reduced contentness. While the FSLN, the Sandinistas, were not doing too hot, the Contras were not doing much better. Their atrocious record of raping and murdering and pillaging civilian villages had kind of caught up with them. And as we talked about at the end of part two, the U.S., Ban directly funding Contras, and I believe that was episode twelve, uh, you know, part two of this Nicaraguan series. Uh, the U.S. banned directly funding the Contras, but you know, you can check out part three to find out how they sh- really still made sure the Contras had everything they needed. Not only was the cocaine smuggling going on, but this was also the time of the much more well-known Iran Contra scandal, where Oliver North and Ronald Reagan. You know, he, he says he says his heart doesn't tell him that he did it, but the facts and the evidence point to uh, to otherwise. Um, they sold arms to the Iranians as an additional source of funding for the Contras. So, you know, what do the Ayatollah Khomeini and Freeway Rick Ross have in common? Well, they both help keep the Contras afloat during the 1980s. Uh, so <laughs> it's a little, you know, fun trivia question there to really stump someone, you know, the history nerd in your life. Um while the cocaine was kept under wraps, the North scandal uh, do really kind of represent the beginning of the end for the Contra repression. They were losing funding due to their record and the scandals on the U.S. side of the desperate attempts to, to continue to fund them despite their horrific human rights record and the Sandinistas and Nicaraguan people were really also damaged from years of the terror attacks as well. They wanted to move on. And it began, as the Contras began to fizzle out, you know, peace was eventually achieved. It was a really, really kind of remarkable moment because not only 
was, you know, finally was the Contras was the Contras stifled. Um, you know, the, the Sandinistas were in also, you know, a really really bad position. They had were incredibly bankrupt. They had to do austerity. They had to lay off government workers. They had to, you know, their unions, the government unions even issued a kind of a no strike pledge because the economy was in such bad shape because so much of their, you know, pl- with the economic embargo and with the results from the war, so much of their economy, so much of their industrial production capabilities were just in complete tatters. So it was really not a kind of good economic situation. But the war was over. It was finally a chance for the Sandinistas to rebuild, to get pick up their pick up, kind of get off their feet, and you know, kind of get going. Um, but it, Ortega kind of took a look at the political landscape, the lay of the land of things, and he decided that would not be a good idea to run again. He was becoming more and more unpopular by the day. He was pretty bruised by the war. Um, so he decided to do what no Contra member or zealot or anti-communist American official probably ever predicted he would do, hold an election. He did so in 1991. In a shock, which he even admits he did not expect, he was voted out by a broad center-right alliance led by Violeta Chamorro, a member of the elite right-wing publisher family critical to helping the Sandinistas originally overthrow the Somoza dictatorship. And this kind of goes back to the kind of political orientation of the Somoza, or the uh, Sandinista coalition that we've talked about throughout this series. As we talked about how they they won, they eventually got so many people who were disgusted with the way that Somoza were doing things, hogging all the money to themselves, they eventually even got some real major kind of liberal capitalists, some real ep- economic elites on their side. The Shomoros were a big part when the Shomoro father, I, think, I believe his name was Pedro, got assassinated. There was a big turning point in helping get some of the you know kind of real economic elites on the side of the Sandinistas, saying this this guy Somoza is a unique evil. He's got to go, and we got to get the. Uh, Sandinistas in instead. Now that this was all over, well, let's be honest, Shimura supported the Contras all <laughs> pretty much the entire way throughout. Um, you know, it was very clear that these liberal capitalists were trying to get control in their own right. And Shimura was able to do it successfully. She won uh, the election in a you know in a pretty critical, pretty major win in nineteen ninety and kicked out the guy who everyone said was horrific, a uh, communist dictator, ready to suck the blood out of the entire country, all that stuff. Um, you know, it, it was really kind of a so- shocking thing because even after years of siege, uh, Ortega really shocked all by giving up power freely, bucking the trend of authoritarian rulers, kind of a, hanging on to power with every single possible fiber of their being, um, and he kind of went quietly. He went with dignity, proving his fiercest critics wrong. And if you look at it, all that fear mongering leading to so much death and destruction, all because a fearsome communist dictator, you know, really was about to take over Nicaragua and then eventually get the Soviets to take over all of Central America and then all the United States and, you know, whatever, you know, crazy propaganda they were saying at the time. All of that built up for a guy who ended up just just leaving normally when he lost the election. Was it all really necessary? How much better could Nicaraguans' lives have been if it had all been avoided? If they had just let the Sandinista Revolution play its course, maybe it still would have turned out the way it ended up turning out. But it would have been, you know, it, the, the the course of events would have run naturally, not with the United States funding a massive terrorist group to destroy the government kind of in its crib here. Um which is a major, major part of this. It's this kind of counterfactual that really throughout this research, I kept coming back to. I kept thinking, what would it be like if they had just left them alone? If they had just let Daniel Ortega play out, do his thing, try and start you know, his new government, try and you know, kind of gain economic and political independence from Nicaraguans. Would he have been able to do that? Could he have been able to do that? You know, it's hard to say. It really is. Um, but we will never know because of the real all out economic, political, and actual war war, you know, full out war that they waged against his government. I mean, it it really was interesting, um, you know, because he, he ends up leaving. He was pretty gracious in defeat. Uh here is what he had to say as he prepared to uh prepared his gracious exit. Uh, he prepared to bow out. Uh, from his time as leader 
of the Sandinistas, and he seemed to be pretty confident he would be playing a role in the Nicaraguan political scene for years to come. We're used to fighting from the bottom. We're used to fighting our torturers, our jailers. And now that there is a revolutionary people's power in Nicaragua, we are better positioned to very soon return to govern this country from the top. So it does, that's kind of an interesting way of phrasing it, because governing from the top is certainly would kind of be what Ortega would do from then on. Um, up until this point, Ortega had kind of been the picture-perfect leader of the revolution, the guy who's always there for the people, who had a you know, strong support of all his comrades, and who had you know led the revolution through you know insurgents and U.S.-backed terror groups that had tried to you know really overthrow and kill civilians, just screw the government up by any possible manner. Um, and from from that period, from the moment he kind of lost the election, maybe it was just too much of a shock to him. You know, you can never know; you can never really get inside his head, but. He just decided through the rest of his life, the rest of that period, to gradually drift away from all of that. On the way out, this was kind of the first big moment. The Sandinistas quietly began to uh, pass two laws that accelerated the process of ensuring the land redistributed from the Sandinistas from the Somoza regime, where a lot of the kind of wealthy planter elites had it. Uh, you know, was redistributed from the Sandinistas, stayed in the hands of the Sandinistas rather than the actual people. Although much of it was fair, they received criticism on the way out for making it so that too much of the land stayed with FSLN party members and not peasants in far worse economic situations. The new government, led by Shomoro, started the process, meanwhile, of disarmament, which was really, funnily enough, joined by George H.W. Bush, of all people, uh, who was probably just sitting there with a very, very uh, kind of smirk on his face, thinking, well, looks like we are where we are now. I'm sorry, my, my, my H.W. Bush impression is, is bad. Nice try, communists. Looks like we're back in charge now. Uh, <laughs> it was probably uh, his thought there. Uh, but uh, it was kind of, kind of an ironic moment there for someone who was probably in the planning room and all this stuff was going on. Uh, yeah, so people were, were quite glad that the war was over, but they felt they lost something from the hopeful revolutionary days. Ortega was ready to seize on that and had already begun planning a return. As leader of the opposition, though, he began to cut shady deals with the political opposition with an eye towards personal accumulation of power. Even, you know, this this got so blatant that it led his former running mate, Sergio Ramirez, to found a breakaway party, the Sandinista Renovation Party, because as he saw it, Ortega only wanted power, not democracy, and was willing to achieve it at any cost, which he could not support. He thought it ran contrary to the ethical principles of the FSL and government and just couldn't support it. This is a guy who was with him, running mate, vice president of the country from 1985 to 1990, the last five years of the the war, really some of those brutal parts of the war, and the kind of really tough, tough period after. He just felt, really, that Ortega was beginning to go against all principles. He began to make deals with the ruling right-wing party to divide up control of key institutions under the table, as he knew they needed his support for a parliamentary majority, and he saw it as a way to get his party and himself back into a position of power. Meanwhile, the current right-wing president, the right-wing president at the time, a few years later, uh, the successor to Shomoro, kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s, Arnoldo Alaman was gaining so much wealth from corruption, it made the Samosas look tame. All of a sudden, in a country where everyone was incredibly impoverished, he became a multi-millionaire. After leaving office, he was tried and sentenced to 20 years in prison for swindling money from the state coffers. But Ortega, now firmly one of them, used his influence to free the corrupt Alaman and even acquit the guy, of course, at a price. Alamon's right-wing coalition gave the support Ortega needed, and they changed the electoral law to make the presidential election just one round and the threshold for victory just 35%. Now, all he needed on his path back to power was the support of the pro-contra Managua archbishop who support, who, excuse me, spoke out against him at the height of the Contra War. 
In order to do this, though, Ortega had to pass a socially conservative legislation outlawing abortion and even asked the right-wing cardinal to renew his and his wife's marriage vows. This is a, kind of a very, very personal moment for him, which he completely gave over to this leader of the Contras. Uh, this, again, was, was really the, the spiritual leader of the Contras that he was kneeling before uh, for his wife to kind of, uh, you know, him and his wife to kind of set up his marriage vows here, all because he wanted that power. He wanted to get back in a good position. Um, and this really, this this kowtowing to the Catholic Church for, you know, the support, especially after their incredible material support and, you know, just spiritual support for the Contras, um, you know, this was viewed as kind of the ultimate sellout for a lot of his former kind of his day one supporters um, who really thought that he was beginning to support the people who tried to kill him and kill his government and really turn against his day one supporters. He was denounced by them, but won back an old friend, Eden Pastora, who attacked the Sandinistas soon after they won for their left wing turn and even flirted with the Contra command post during the height of the war. But he, due to the pragmatism and the centrism of the party, and then his willingness to quote unquote make a good deal, uh, Eden Pastora was back on side. So centrist that even in the 2006 election, he selected a former Contra leader as his running mate. So long to his old comrade Sergio Ramirez, who is now reduced, or I shouldn't say reduced, but you know is now a novelist. So let's just put it that way. Even as you know, FSL and leaders are incredibly wealthy, um, you know, owning real estate, all that stuff. You know, credit to Sergio Ramirez, credit to a lot of the other people uh, kind of involved in this. You know, huge credit to someone like Monica Baltadano, um, who really just called him out and said, this is unacceptable. You are portraying the causes of your revolution. I mean, this is a guy who went back into power with a completely different, almost opposing coalition than the time where he entered power. I mean, he had the elites, the Catholics, the, even the literal Contra commanders on his side. He then even squeaked to victory with 37% of the vote, just over the threshold, which he had lowered for himself. Now, 20 years since the end of the fighting, and people had begun to reconcile. They now see each other more and more, according to you know research, reports from the country, all that, as citizens in the same fight, much more and then, you know, citizens on two sides of the communist, anti-communist divide and are much more against the killing. Could be in large part because they all realize they're in the same economic situation, no matter Sandinista or Contra fighter, which is abject poverty. Meanwhile, Sandinista leaders are wealthy businessmen and real estate holders. And it seems like the revolutionary fervor has been shot out of the Sandinista movement and the Nicaraguan people in general. Daniel Ortega is still the president today and has recently been accused of taking further steps to undermine the holding of free and fair elections and the peaceful transition to power. And as the Sandinistas become increasingly ideological and po politically incoherent, the once best hope for economic power to the average Nicaraguan, for the average Nicaraguan to take control of their own destiny and live a life where they have control over their own political and economic circumstances, has faded into the background with all the other hopeless political forces that have continued to leave the people in abject poverty. Whether that can be attributed to the political mistakes in the broad coalition made by the Sandinistas in their rise, the U.S. war on the FSLN government, forcing them into making really awful decisions with their kind of tail between their legs and um, so much so that it led to their eventual dissolution or the betrayal of Daniel Ortega in his later years is a topic for endless historical debate. But the fact remains that as the conflict dies down, it's become clear that the only losers in all of this are the same who have been placed at the bottom of Nicaraguan society in pretty much every era or period throughout its history the people themselves. That concludes this episode and season of Hidden History. Thanks so much for sticking with me this summer, and I hope you enjoyed hearing the stories of these revolutionaries, their revolutions, and the backlash that followed. And I hope they've inspired you, or at least informed you, about the true power structures that make our world what it is today. So until next time, thank you so much for exploring this hidden history with me. My name is Spencer Walsh, See you soon.
Hidden History returns this winter for Season 5 on the Spencer Walsh Radio Network.